Chapter Four of the Mysteries of Paris by Eugène Sue. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Avoid Temptation, Part One. It is night. Profound silence reigns in the pavilion inhabited by Jacques Ferrand, interrupted only at intervals by gusts of wind and the dashing of rain which falls in torrents. These melancholy sounds seem to render still more complete the solitude of this abode. In a sleeping room in the first floor, very nicely and newly furnished and covered with a thick carpet a young female is standing up before a fireplace in which there is a cheerful blaze it is strange but in the centre of the door carefully bolted and which is opposite to the bed is a small glass door five or six inches square which opens from the outside a small reflecting lamp cast a half shadow in this chamber hung with garnet-coloured paper the curtains of the bed and the window as well as the cover of the large sofa are of silk and woollen damask of the same colour we are precise in the details of this demi-luxury so recently imported into the notary's residence because it announces a complete revolution in the habits of jacques ferrand who until now was of the most sordid avarice and of spartan disregard especially as it concerned others to everything that respected comfortable existence it is on this garnet-coloured ground that was shadowed forth the figure of cecily which we will now attempt to paint tall and graceful the creole was in the full flower of her age her spreading shoulders and hips made her waist appear so singularly small that it seemed as if it could be easily spanned as simple as it was coquettish her alsatian costume was of singular taste somewhat theatrical but for that reason more capable of producing the effect she desired her bodice of black cashmere half open on her full bosom was very long-waisted with tight sleeves plain back and slightly embroidered with purple wool down the seams perfected by a row of small cut silver buttons a short petticoat of orange merino which seemed of vast fullness descended little lower than the knee her stockings were of scarlet with blue clocks as we see them in the drawings of the old flemish painters who so complacently show us the garters of their robust heroines no artist ever drew more perfect legs than were those of cecily symmetrical and slim beneath the swelling calf they terminated in a small foot quite at ease and yet restrained in the small slipper of black morocco with silver buckles cecily was looking into the glass over the mantelpiece the slope of her bodice displayed her elegant and dimpled neck of dazzling but not transparent whiteness taking off her cap of cherry-coloured velvet to replace it with a kerchief she displayed her thick magnificent head of hair of lustrous black which divided over her brows and naturally curling came down only to the necklace of venus which unites the neck and shoulders it is necessary to know the inimitable taste with which the creoles twist around their heads their kerchiefs of bright hues to have an idea of the graceful headdress of cecily and the piquant contrast of this variegated covering of purple blue and orange with the black silky tresses which escaping from beneath the tight fold of the night kerchief surrounded her pale but round and firm cheeks with her two arms raised above her head she proceeded with the ends of her fingers as slender as spindles of ivory to arrange a large rosette placed very low on the left side almost over her ear cecily's features were such as once seen it is impossible ever to forget a bold forehead somewhat projecting surmounts her face which was a perfect oval her pearly white complexion the satiny freshness of the camellia leaf slightly touched by a sun-ray her eyes of almost disproportionate size have a singular expression for their irises extremely large black and brilliant hardly allow the blue transparency of the orbits at the two extremities of the lids fringed with long lashes to be visible her chin is very distinctly prominent her nose straight and thin ends in two delicate nostrils which dilate on the least emotion her mouth insolent and amorous is of bright purple we must imagine this colourless countenance with its bright black glance its two red pulpy and humid lips which glisten like wet coral such was cecily her infamous instincts at first repressed by her real attachment for david not being developed till she reached europe civilization and the influence of northern climates had tempered their violence we have already said that cecily had scarcely reached germany when first seduced by a man of desperately depraved habits she unknown to david who loved her with equal idolatry and blindness exercised and turned to account for a considerable time all her seductive powers 
but soon the scandal of her adventures was raised abroad and such exposures ensued that she was sentenced to perpetual imprisonment to all this let there be joined a plastic adroit insinuating mind an intelligence so wonderful that in a year she spoke french and german with perfect ease sometimes even with natural eloquence then add a corrupted heart worthy of the courtesan queen of ancient rome in audacity and courage proof against everything instincts of diabolical wickedness and then we may understand the new servant of jacques ferrand the resolute being who had dared to venture into the wolf's den yes strange anomaly on learning from m de Grone the inciting and platonic part she was to play with the notary and what avenging ends were to be derived from her seductions cecily had promised to go through the character with love or rather terrible hatred against jacques ferrand being sincerely indignant at the recital of the infamous violence he had exercised against louise a recital necessary to be unfolded to the creole to put her on her guard against the hypocritical attempts of this monster a few retrospective words as to this latter are indispensable when cecily was presented by madame pipelet as an orphan over whom she did not desire to maintain any right any control the notary was perhaps less smitten by the beauty of the creole than fascinated by her irresistible look a look which at the first interview disturbed the reason of jacques ferrand we have already said in reference to the insensate boldness of some of his words when conversing with madame de lucenay that this man usually so completely master of himself so calm so cunning so subtle forgot the cold calculation of his deep dissimulation when the demon of desire darkened his better sense besides he had no cause to distrust the protege of madame pipelet after her conversation with alfred's spouse madame seraphin had proposed to jacques ferrand a young girl almost destitute to replace louise and he had eagerly accepted the offer in the hopes of taking advantage of the isolated and precarious position of his new servant moreover far from being predisposed to mistrust jacques ferrand found in the march of events fresh motives for security all succeeded to his utmost wishes the death of madame seraphin released him from a dangerous accomplice the death of fleur de marie he believed her dead delivered him from a living proof of one of his earliest crimes finally thanks to the death of the chouette and the unexpected murder of the countess macgregor whose life was despaired of he no longer had these two women to fear whose disclosures and attacks might have been most disastrous to him the disposition habits and former life of jacques ferrand known and displayed the exciting beauty of the creole admitted as we have endeavoured to paint her together with other facts we shall detail as we proceed will account we presume for the sudden passion the unbridled desire of the notary for this seductive and dangerous creature then we must add that if women of cecily's stamp inspire nothing but repugnance and disgust to men endued with tender and elevated sentiments with delicate and pure tastes they exercise a sudden action a magic omnipotence over men of brutal sensuality like jacques ferrand thus a just and avenging fatality brought the creole into contact with the notary and a terrible expiation was beginning for him a fierce passion had urged him on to persecute with pitiless malice an indigent and honest family and to spread amongst them misery madness and death this passion was now to be the formidable chastisement of this great culprit although jacques ferrand was never to have his desires realized the creole took care not to deprive him of all hope but the vague and distant prospects she held out were so coloured by caprices that they were an additional torture and more completely enslaved him if we are astonished that a man of such vigour and audacity had not recourse to stratagem or violence to triumph over the calculating resistance of cecily we forget that cecily was not a second louise besides the day after her presentation to the notary she had played quite another part from that by aid of which she had been introduced to her master for he had not been the dupe of his servant two days forewarned of the fate of louise by the baron de Grone, and knowing besides by what abominable means she had become the prey of the notary the creole on entering this solitary house had taken excellent precautions for passing her first night there in perfect security the evening of her arrival being alone with jacques ferrand he in order not to alarm her pretended scarcely to look at her and rudely ordered her to bed she told him naively that she was afraid of thieves in the night but that she was resolute and capable of defending herself 
at the same time drawing from her large woollen pelisse a small but exceedingly keen stiletto the sight of which set the notary thinking believing that cecily was afraid of robbers only he showed her to the late chamber of louise after having examined it cecily said trembling she would sleep in a chair because the door had neither lock nor bolt jacques ferrand unwilling to compromise himself by rousing cecily's suspicions promised a bolt should be fixed the creole did not go to bed in the morning the notary sent to her to show her how to set about her work he had promised himself to preserve for the first few days a hypocritical reserve with respect to his new servant in order to inspire her with confidence but smitten by her beauty which by daylight was even more striking blinded maddened by his desires which already got the better of him he stammered out some compliments as to the figure and beauty of cecily she with keen sagacity had judged that from her first interview with the notary he was completely caught in her spells at the confession he made of his flame she thought it policy to cast aside at once her feigned timidity and as we have said to change her mask the creole suddenly assumed a bold air jacques ferrand again complimented her beauty and her graceful figure look at me well said cecily to him in a bold tone although i am dressed as an alsatian peasant do i look like a servant what do you mean cried jacques ferrand look at this hand does it appear accustomed to hard labour and she presented a white delicate hand with long and slender fingers with nails as rosy and polished as agate but whose root slightly browned betrayed the creole blood and this foot is it that of a servant and she protruded a beautiful small foot coquettishly shod which the notary had not before remarked and from which he only removed his eyes to gaze on cecily with amazement i told my aunt pipelette what story i chose she knew nothing of my former life and believes me reduced to my present condition through the death of my parents and takes me for a servant but you i hope have too much sagacity to show her error dear master who then are you exclaimed jacques ferrand more and more surprised at her language that is my secret for reasons best known to myself i was obliged to quit germany in this attire i wished to remain concealed in paris for some time being as secluded as possible my aunt supposing me reduced to misery proposed to me your service telling me of the solitary life which i must of compulsion lead in your house informing me that i should never have leave to quit it i accepted the offer unhesitatingly without knowing it my aunt had anticipated my most earnest desire who would think of looking for and finding me here and what have you done to compel you to seek concealment agreeable sins perhaps but that is also my secret and what are your intentions mademoiselle what they always have been but for your significant compliments as to my shape and beauty perhaps i should not have confessed so much to you although no doubt your clear-sightedness would sooner or later have induced my confession now listen to me my dear master i have for the moment accepted the condition or rather the character of a servant circumstances compelled me i have courage enough to sustain the character to the end and will risk all the consequences i will serve you with zeal activity and respect in order to retain my situation that is to say a sure and unknown asylum but on the least word of gallantry the least liberty you take with me i will leave you not from prudery there is nothing of the prude about me i fancy and she darted a look at the notary which had full effect no i am no prude she continued with a provoking smile which displayed her teeth of dazzling whiteness indeed no when i love i do love but be discreet and you will see that your unworthy servant has no desire but honestly to discharge her duty as a servant now you have my secret or at least a portion of it but should you by any chance desire to act as a gentleman should you find me too handsome to serve you should you like to change parts and become my slave be it so frankly speaking i should prefer it and had rather you should feel paternally disposed towards me that would not prevent you from saying that you found me charming this will be the recompense of your devotion and discretion the only one the only one stammered jacques ferrand the only one unless solitude make me mad which is impossible for you will keep me company come make up your mind no ambiguity i either serve you or you shall serve me if not i leave your house and beg my aunt to find me another place 
all this may perhaps appear strange to you but if you take me for an adventuress without any means of existence you are wrong in order that my aunt should be my accomplice without knowing it i have made her believe that i was so poor that i could not purchase any other garments than those i now wear i have however as you see a tolerably well-filled purse on this side gold on the other diamonds and cecily displayed before the notary's eyes a long red silk purse filled with gold and through the meshes of which he could also see several sparkling gems unfortunately all the money in the world could not purchase for me a retreat so secure as your house so isolated from the very solitude in which you live except then one or other of my offers and you will do me a kindness you see i place myself almost at your discretion for to say to you i conceal myself is to say to you i am sought for but i am sure you will not betray me even if you could this romantic confidence this sudden change of character completely upset all jacques ferrand's ideas who was this woman why did she conceal herself was it chance alone that had brought her to him if she came with some secret aim what could it be amongst all the ideas which this singular adventure gave rise to in the notary's mind the real motive of the creole's presence did not occur to him he had not or rather he believed he had no other enemies than the victims of his licentiousness and his cupidity and all these were in such miserable circumstances that he could not suspect them capable of spreading any net for him of which cecily should be the bait and then moreover what could be the motive of any such snare no the sudden transformation of cecily inspired jacques ferrand with one fear only he believed that this woman did not tell the truth and was perhaps an adventuress who thinking him rich had introduced herself into his house to wheedle and get money from him and perhaps induce him to marry her but although his avarice at once revolted at this idea he perceived and trembled that his suspicions and reflections were too late for he might by one word have calmed his distrust by sending away this woman from his house but this word he could not say these thoughts hardly occupied him a moment so fascinated had he become he already loved after his own fashion and the idea of being separated from this enchanting creature seemed impossible and he felt also a jealousy which made him say to himself so long as she is immured in my house she can have no other lover the boldness of her language the wantonness of her look the freedom of her manner all revealed that she was not as she had said a prude this conviction giving vague hopes to the notary still more assured cecily's empire in a word jacques ferrand's passion choking the calm voice of reason he blindly resigned himself to all that might result it was agreed that cecily should only be the servant in appearance thus there would be no scandal besides in order the more completely to render his guest at her ease he was not to engage any other servant but make up his mind to wait on her and on himself the meals were brought from a neighbouring tavern the porter swept out and attended to the office and he paid for his clerk's breakfast then the notary would furnish at once an apartment on the first floor as cecily wished she desired to pay for it but he refused and spent two thousand francs eighty livres this was enormous generosity and proved the unheard-of violence of his passion then began the terrible life of this miserable wretch enclosed in the impenetrable solitude of this house inaccessible to all more and more under the galling yoke of his mad love careless of penetrating the secret of this singular woman from a master he was made a slave he was cecily's valet served her at meal-times and took care of her apartment forewarned by the baron that louise had been overcome by a narcotic the creole drank only pure water eating only of dishes with which it was impossible to tamper she had selected the apartment she was to occupy assuring herself that there was no concealed entrance besides jacques ferrand soon discovered that cecily was not a woman whom he could assail with impunity she was vigorous agile and dangerously armed thus a frenzied delirium alone could have incited him to attempt force and she was quite protected from this peril yet that she might not weary and utterly repulse the notary's passion the creole seemed sometimes touched by his assiduities 
and flattered by the control which she exercised over him and perceiving that he hoped by dint of proofs of devotion and self-denial he should contrive to make her overlook his age and ugliness she amused herself with telling him that if she ever could love him how excessive that love would be with this jacques ferrand's reason wandered and he would frequently walk in his garden at night absorbed in his own reflections sometimes he gazed for hours into the bedroom of the creole for she had allowed a small window to be made in the door which she frequently and intentionally left open absorbed lost wandering indifferent to his most important interests or the preservation of his reputation as an austere serious and pious man her reputation usurped it is true but at the same time acquired after long years of dissimulation and chicanery he amazed his clerks by his aberration of mind offended his clients by his refusals to receive them and abruptly refused the visits of the priests who deceived by his hypocrisy had been until then his warmest champions we have said that cecily was dressing her head before her glass at a slight noise in the corridor she turned her head towards the door in spite of the noise she had heard cecily continued her night toilet tranquilly she drew from her corsage where it was placed almost like a busk a stiletto five or six inches long enclosed in a case of black chagrin having a small ebony handle with silver threads a plain handle but very fit for use it was not a mere weapon for show cecily took the dagger from its scabbard with excessive precaution and laid it on the marble mantelpiece the blade of finest temper and damascus steel was triangular with keen edges and the point as sharp as a needle would have pierced a shilling without turning the edge impregnated with a subtle and rapid poison the slightest puncture of this poniard was mortal jacques ferrand having one day alluded to the danger of this weapon the creole made in his presence an experiment in anima vita that is to say on the unfortunate house-dog which slightly pricked on the nose fell and died in horrible convulsions the stiletto placed on the mantelpiece cecily took off her black bodice and was then with her shoulders neck and arms denuded like a lady in her ball-dress like most of the creole women she wore instead of stays another bodice of stout linen which fitted her figure very closely her orange-coloured petticoat remaining attached to this sort of white spencer with short sleeves and cut very low formed a costume less precise than the other and harmonized wonderfully with the scarlet stocking and the coloured handkerchief so coquettishly arranged around the creole's head nothing could be more perfect more beautifully defined than the graceful contour of her arms and shoulders a heavy sigh aroused cecily's attention she smiled as she twisted around her finger one of her curling tresses which had escaped from beneath her headdress. cecily cecily murmured a voice which was plaintive though coarse and through the wicket was visible the pale and flat face of jacques ferrand cecily silent until then began to hum a creole air the words of this melody were sweet and expressive although repressed the full contra alto of cecily was heard above the noise of the torrents of the rain and gusts of wind which seemed to shake the old house to its very foundation cecily cecily repeated jacques ferrand in a tone of supplication the creole paused suddenly and turned her head around quickly as if for the first time she then heard the notary's voice and going towards the door what dear master she called him so in derision you there she said with a slight foreign accent which gave additional charm to her full and sarcastic voice oh how beautiful you are murmured the notary you think so said cecily doesn't my headdress become me i think you handsomer every day only see how white my arm is monster be gone be gone shouted jacques ferrand furious cecily burst into a loud fit of laughter no no it is too much to suffer oh if i were not afraid of death said the notary gloomily but to die is to renounce you altogether and you are so beautiful i would rather then suffer and look at you look at me why that's what the wicket was made for and so we can thus chat like two friends in our solitude which really is not irksome to me you are such a good master what a dangerous confession i make through the door 
will you never open this door you see how submissive i am this evening i might have tried to enter into your chamber with you but i did not do so you are submissive for two reasons in the first place because you know that having from the necessity of my wandering life always had the precaution to carry a stiletto i can manage with a strong hand this inestimable jewel whose tooth is sharper than a viper's and you know too that from the day in which i have to complain of you i will quit this roof for ever leaving you a thousand times more enamoured than ever since you have so greatly honoured your unworthy servant as to say that you are enamoured of her my servant it is i who am your slave your mocked derided despised slave that's true enough and yet it does not move you it amuses me the days and especially the nights are so long accursed creature but seriously you look so perfectly wretched your features have so sensibly altered that i am quite flattered at it it is a poor triumph but you are the only one here to hear that and me consume in impotent rage have you really any understanding why i never said anything more tender jeer at me jeer at me i do not jeer i never before saw a man of your age in love after your fashion and i must confess a young and handsome man would be incapable of these outrageous passions an adonis admires himself as much as he admires us he likes us and we choose to notice him nothing more simple he has a claim to our love but is hardly grateful but to show favour to a man like you my master dear would be to take him from earth to heaven to fulfil his wildest dreams his most insensate hopes for if some being were to say to you you love cecily to distraction if i chose she would be yours next minute you would suppose such a being endued with supernatural power shouldn't you master dear yes ah oh, yes well if you could convince me more satisfactorily of your passion i might perchance have the whimsical fancy to enact the supernatural part myself in your favour do you comprehend i comprehend that you are still fooling me that you are still pitiless perhaps for solitude creates so many singular fancies until this moment cecily's accent had been sarcastic but she pronounced these last words with a serious reflecting tone and accompanied them with a look which made the notary start silence do not look at me thus you will drive me mad i would rather you denied me at least i could then hate you drive you from my house cried jacques ferrand who again gave himself up to a vain hope yes for i should then hope nothing from you but misery misery i know you well enough now to hope in spite of myself that one day i might from your very hate or proud caprice obtain what i shall never owe to your love you bid me convince you of my passion do you not see how unhappy i am i will do all i can to please you you desire to be concealed from all eyes and from all eyes i conceal you perchance at the risk of compromising myself most seriously for indeed i know not who you are i respect your secret i never speak to you of it i have interrogated you as to your past life and you have given me no answer well then i was very wrong i'll give you a mark of blind confidence o oh master dear and so listen another bitter jest no doubt no a serious tale you ought at least to know the life of her to whom you afford such generous hospitality then cecily continued in a tone of hypocritical and lachrymose earnestness daughter of a brave soldier brother of my aunt pipelet i received an education beyond my condition i was seduced and then abandoned by a rich young gentleman then to escape the anger of my father whose notions of honour were most strict i fled my native country then bursting into a loud fit of laughter cecily added now i hope that's what you call a very pretty and particularly probable tale for it has been very often told amuse your curiosity with that until you get hold of some other story more interesting i was certain it was some cruel jest said the notary with concentrated rage nothing touches you nothing what must i do tell me i serve you like the lowest footboy for you i neglect my dearest interests i no longer know what i do 
i am a subject of astonishment and derision to my own clerks my clients hesitate any longer to entrust me with their affairs i have severed my connection with some religious persons whom i knew intimately i dare not think of what the world will say of my change of demeanour and habits but you do not know no you do not know the fatal consequences my mad passion for you may entail on me yet i give you ample proof of my devotion will you have more speak is it gold you would have they think me richer than i am but i what could i do with your gold asked cecily interrupting the notary and shrugging her shoulders living in this chamber what is the use of gold your invention is at fault it is no fault of mine if you are a prisoner is this chamber displeasing to you will you have one more splendid speak order once more what is the use what is the use oh if i might here expect a beloved one full of the love he inspires and participates i would have gold silks flowers perfumes all the wonders of luxury nothing could be too sumptuous too enchanting to enshrine my love said cecily with an impassioned voice well these wonders of luxury say but a word and what's the use what's the use why make a frame for which there is no picture and the adored one where is he where is he master dear true exclaimed the notary with bitterness i am old i am ugly i can only inspire disgust and aversion she overwhelms me with contempt jests at me and yet i have not the resolution the power to send her away i have only the resolution to suffer oh silly old mourner and what an absurd elderly gentleman with his sufferings cried cecily in a contemptuous and sarcastic tone he only knows how to groan to despair and yet he has been for ten days shut up alone with a young woman in a lone house but this woman scorns me this woman is armed this woman is shut up groaned the notary furiously well conquer her scorn make the dagger fall from her hands compel her to open the door which separates her from yourself but not by brute force that would be useless how then by the strength of your passion passion and can i inspire it why you are nothing but a lawyer affecting piety i really pity you is it for me to teach you your part you are ugly be terrible and one may forget your ugliness you are old be energetic and one may forget your age you are repulsive become menacing since you cannot be the noble steed that neighs proudly in the midst of his harem do not become the stupid camel that bends the knee and offers his back be the tiger the old tiger that roars in the midst of carnage still excites admiration his tigress responds to him from the deepest recesses of the desert end of chapter four part one read by celine major chapter four part two of the mysteries of paris by eugene sue this librivox recording is in the public domain avoid temptation part two at this language which was not deficient in a sort of natural and hardy eloquence jacques ferrand shuddered struck by the expression wild and almost fierce which cecily's features displayed as with her bosom palpitating her nostrils open her mouth defying she fastened on him her large and brilliant black eyes never had she seemed to him more fascinating or more resplendently beautiful than at this moment speak speak again he exclaimed with excitement for now you speak in earnest oh if i could one can do what one wishes replied cecily sternly but but i tell you old as you are if i were in your place i would undertake to engage the affections of a young and handsome woman and once having achieved this result what had been against me would turn to my advantage what pride what triumph to say to oneself i have made my age and ugliness forgotten the love that is shown me i do not owe to pity but to my spirit my courage and my skill yes and now if there were here some handsome young fellows brilliant with grace and attractions the lovely woman whom i have subdued by proofs of a resistless and unbounded devotion would not deign to cast a look at them 
no for she would know that these elegant effeminates would fear to compromise the tie of their cravat or a curl of their hair in obedience to her caprices whilst if she cast her handkerchief in the midst of flames on a signal from her her old tiger would rush into the furnace with a roar of ecstasy yes i would do it try try exclaimed jacques ferrand more and more excited cecily continued drawing nearer to the aperture and fixing on jacques ferrand a steadfast and penetrating look for this woman would well know continued the creole that she would have some exorbitant caprice to satisfy that these dandies would look at their money if they had any or if they had not at some other low consideration whilst her old tiger would consider nothing nothing i tell you fortune honour he he would sacrifice all really said cecily putting her lovely fingers on the bony fingers of jacques ferrand whose clutched hands passed through the small glass door were clasping the top of the ledge would not this woman be ardently loved added cecily if she had an enemy and with a gesture pointed him out to her old tiger and said to him strike and he would strike exclaimed jacques ferrand attempting to press cecily's fingers with his parched lips really the old tiger would strike said the creole placing her hand gently on the hand of jacques ferrand to possess you cried the wretch i could commit a crime ah master said cecily suddenly and withdrawing her hand go go in my turn i scarcely know you you do not seem to me so ugly as you did just now but go go and she left the aperture abruptly the artful creature gave to her gestures and these last words an appearance of truth so perfect and a look of such surprise as if angry and disappointed with herself for having for an instant only appeared to forget the ugliness of jacques ferrand that he transported by frenzied hope cried as he clung convulsively to the ledge of the aperture cecily come back come back bid me do what you will i will be your tiger no no master said cecily still retreating and in order to forget you i will sing a song of my country cecily return exclaimed jacques ferrand in a supplicating tone no no later when i can without danger but the light of this lamp hurts my eyes this soft languor overcomes my senses and cecily extinguished the lamp took down a guitar and made up the fire whose increased blaze then lighted up the whole apartment from the narrow window where he stood motionless such was the picture that jacques ferrand perceived in the midst of the luminous circle formed by the flickering blaze on the fire cecily in a position full of softness and abandonment half reclining on a large sofa of garnet damask held a guitar on which she ran over several harmonious preludes the firelight threw its red tints on the creole who appeared thus in strong relief to complete the tableau the reader must call to mind the mysterious and singular appearance of a room in which the fire from the great struggles with the deep and large black shadows which tremble on the ceiling and the walls the storm without increased and roared loudly whilst she preludized on her guitar cecily fixed her eyes immovably on jacques ferrand who fascinated could not take his look from her now master mine said the creole listen to a song of my country we do not understand how to make verses but have a simple recitative without rhyme and between each rest we improvise as well we can a symphony appropriate to the idea of the couplet it is very simple and pastoral and i am sure master it will please you and cecily began a kind of recitative much more accentuated by the expression of the voice than the modulation of the music some soft and vibrating chords served as accompaniment this was cecily's song flowers still flowers everywhere my lover is coming my hope of happiness unnerves me let us subdue the glare of daylight pleasure seeks the softer shade my lover prefers my breath to the perfume of the sweetest flowers the brightness of day will not affect his eyelids for my kisses will keep them closed come 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 love come 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 these words uttered with animation as if the creole was addressing an unseen lover were rendered by her the theme of a delicious melody her charming fingers produced from the guitar an instrument of no great power vibrations full of harmony 
the impassioned look of cecily her half-closed humid eyes fastened on jacques ferrand were full of the expression of expectation words of love delicious music together conspired at the moment to bereave jacques ferrand of his reason and half frenzied he exclaimed mercy cecily mercy you will drive me distracted oh be silent or i die oh that i were mad listen to the second couplet master said the creole again touching the chords and she thus continued her impassioned recitative if my lover were here and his hand touched my bare shoulder i should tremble and die if he were here and his curly hair touched my cheek my pale cheek would become purple my pale cheek would be on fire soul of my soul if thou wert here my parched lips would not utter a word life of my life if thou wert here i should expiring ask thy pardon tis sweet to die for and with those we love angel come come to my heart come 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 if the creole had rendered the first strophe with languid pleasure she put in her last words with all the enthusiasm of antique love and as if the music had been powerless to express her intense passion she threw her guitar from her and half rising and extending her arms towards the door where jacques ferrand stood she repeated in a faltering dying tone oh come 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 it would be impossible to depict the electric look with which she accompanied these words jacques ferrand uttered a terrible cry oh death death to him whom you could thus love he cried shaking the door in a burst of jealousy and furious rage agile as a panther cecily was at the door with one bound and as if she with difficulty repressed her feigned transports she said to jacques ferrand in a low concentrated palpitating voice well then i will confess i am excited by my song i did not mean to approach the door again yet here i am in spite of myself for i hear still the words you said just now if you bade me strike i would strike you love me then will you have gold all my gold no i have enough have you an enemy i will kill him i have no enemy will you be my wife i'll marry you i am married what would you then oh what would you prove to me that your passion for me is blind furious and that you would sacrifice all to it ah uh, yes all but how i do not know but a moment since your eyes fascinated me if again you give me one of those marks of intense love which excite the imagination of a woman to madness i know not of what i should not be capable make haste then for i am capricious and to-morrow perhaps all the impression will be effaced but what proof can i give you at this moment cried the notary you are but a fool after all replied cecily retreating from the aperture with an air of disdain i was deceived i believed you capable of energetic devotion good night it's a pity cecily do not leave me return what can i do i was but too much disposed to listen to you you will never have such another opportunity but oh tell me what you would have cried the notary half mad eh if you were as passionately in love as you say you would find means to persuade me good night cecily i will shut the door instead of opening it cecily listen i will give you yet another proof of my devotion what is this proof of your love said the creole who having approached the mantelpiece to resume her dagger returned slowly towards the door lighted by the flame of the hearth then unobserved by the notary she made sure of the action of an iron chain which terminated in two small knobs one of which was screwed into the door and the other into the door-post listen said jacques ferrand in a hoarse and broken voice listen if i place my honour my fortune my life at your mercy now this very instant will you then believe i love you your honour your fortune your life i do not comprehend you if i confide to you a secret which may bring me to the scaffold will you then believe me you a criminal you do but jest 
what then of your austere life your piety your honesty all all a lie you pass for a saint and yet you boast of these iniquities no there is no man so craftfully skilful so fortunately bold as thus to captivate the confidence and respect of men that were indeed a fearful defiance cast in the teeth of society i am that man i have cast that sarcasm that defiance in the face of society exclaimed the monster in a tone of ecstatic pride jacques jacques do not speak thus said cecily with a tone of emotion you make me mad my head for your love will you have it so ah this indeed is love here take my poignard you disarm me jacques ferrand took through the wicket the dangerous weapon with due precaution and flung it from him to a distance in the corridor cecily you believe me then he exclaimed with transport do i believe you said the creole energetically pressing her beautiful fingers on the clasped hands of jacques ferrand oh yes i do for now again you look as you did a short time since when my very soul seemed fascinated by your gaze cecily you will speak the words of truth and truth only to me and can you doubt it for a moment ah you will soon have ample proof of my sincerity but what you are about to tell me is quite true is it not i repeat that you may believe each word i utter so much the better since you are enabled to prove your passion by the avowal of them and if i tell you all then will i in return withhold nothing from you for if indeed you have this blind this courageous confidence in me jacques i will call no more for the ideal lover of my song but you my hero my tiger to whom i will sing come come oh come as cecily uttered these words with an air and voice of seductive tenderness she drew so close to the wicket that jacques ferrand could feel the hot breath of the creole pass over his cheek while her fresh full lip lightly touched his coarse vulgar hand call me your tiger your slave what you will and if after that you but divulge what i entrust to you my life will be the consequence yes enchantress a word from you and i perish on a scaffold my honour reputation nay my very existence are henceforward in your hands your honour yes even so but listen about ten years ago i was entrusted with the care of a child and a sum of money for her use amounting to two hundred thousand francs well i wronged the little creature by spreading a false report of her death and then appropriated the money to my own purposes it was boldly and cleverly done who would ever have believed you capable of such conduct again i had a cashier whom i detested and i determined upon ruining him one way or another well one evening under some great emergency he took from my cash-box a trifling amount of gold which he paid back the next day but to wreak my malice on the object of my dislike i accused him of having stolen a large sum of course my testimony was believed and the wretched man was thrown into prison now is not my honour my very safety at your will and pleasure at your word both would be in peril then you love me jacques oh truly blindly love me since you thus surrender to me the most precious secrets of your heart how plainly does it prove the empire i must have over you ah believe me i will not be niggardly in repaying you stoop that brow from which have emanated so many infernal schemes that i may press it with my lips were the scaffold erected for me cried the excited notary did death stare me in the face i would not now recall my words but hearken to what i have still to confess the child i formerly wronged and forsook has again crossed my path her reappearance disquieted me and i have had her murdered murdered and by your orders but how in what manner a few days since it occurred thus near the bridge of asnières at the ile du ravageur a man named martial for a bribe contrived to sink her in a boat made purposely with a false bottom are these particulars sufficient 
will you believe me now oh fiend demon you terrify while you fascinate me in what consists your marvellous power and influence but listen further for i have not yet finished my catalogue of crimes previously to that a man had entrusted me with one hundred thousand crowns i contrived to waylay and blow out his brains making it appear he had fallen by his own hand afterwards when his sister claimed the money entrusted to my charge i denied all knowledge of it now then i have proclaimed myself a malefactor guilty of every crime will you not open your door and admit a lover so ardent so impatient as myself jacques exclaimed the creole with much excitement i admire love nay i adore you let a thousand deaths come cried the notary in a state of enthusiastic delight impossible to describe i will brave them all oh you are right were i ever so young so handsome or so seducing i could not hope for joy such as now swells my heart but delay not charmer of my soul give me the key or yourself undo the bolts which separate us i can endure this torturing suspense no longer the creole took from the lock which she had carefully secured beforehand the key so ardently prayed for and handing it to the notary through the aperture said in a languishing tone of utter abandonment jacques my senses seem forsaking me my brain is on fire i know not what i do or say you are mine then at length my adorable beauty cried he with a wild shout of savage exultation and hastily turning the key in the lock but the firmly bolted door yielded not yet come beloved of my heart murmured cecily in a languid voice bless me with your presence come the bolt the bolt gasped out jacques ferrand breathless with his exertions to force open the door but what if you have been deceiving me cried the creole as though a sudden thought had seized her if you have only invented the secrets with which you affect to entrust me to mock at my credulity to ensnare my confidence the notary appeared thunderstruck with surprise at this fresh expression of doubt at the very moment when he believed himself upon the point of attaining his wishes to find a new obstacle arise when he considered success certain drove him almost furious he rapidly thrust his hand into his breast opened his waistcoat impatiently snapped a steel chain to which was suspended a small red morocco pocket-book took it and showing it to cecily through the aperture cried in a thick palpitating voice this book contains papers that would bring me to a scaffold only undo the bolts which deny me entrance to your presence and this book with all its precious documents is yours oh then let us seal the compact exclaimed cecily as drawing back the bolt with as much noise as possible with one hand with the other she seized the pocket-book but jacques ferrand permitted it not to leave his possession till he felt the door yield to his pressure but though it partially gave way it was but to leave an opening about half a foot wide the solid chain which passed across it above the lock preventing any person's entering as completely as before at this unexpected obstacle jacques ferrand precipitated himself against the door and shook it with desperate fury while cecily with the rapidity of thought took the pocket-book between her teeth opened the window threw a large cloak out into the yard below and light and agile as bold and daring seized a knotted cord previously secured to the balcony and glided from her chamber on the first floor to the court beneath descending with the swiftness of an arrow shot from a bow then wrapping herself hastily in the mantle she flew to the porter's lodge opened the door drew up the string ran into the street and sprang into a hackney-coach which ever since cecily had been with jacques ferrand came regularly every evening in case of need by baron groan's orders and took up its station a short distance from the notary's house directly she had entered the vehicle it drove off at the topmost speed of the two strong powerful horses that drew it and had reached the boulevards ere jacques ferrand had even discovered cecily's flight we will now return to the disappointed wretch from the situation of the door he was unable to perceive the window by which the creole had contrived to prepare and make good her plight but concentrating all his powers 
by a vigorous application of his brawny shoulders jacques ferrand succeeded in forcing out the chain which kept the door from opening with furious impatience he rushed into the chamber it was empty the knotted cord was still suspended to the balcony of the window from which she leaned and then at the other extremity of the courtyard he saw by means of the moon which just then shone out from behind the stormy clouds which had hitherto obscured it the dim outline of the outer gate swinging to and fro as though left open by some person having hastily passed through then did jacques ferrand divine the whole of the scheme so successfully laid to entrap him but a glimmer of hope still remained determined and vigorous he threw his leg over the balcony let himself down in his turn by the cord and hastily quitted the house the street was quite deserted not a creature was to be seen and the only sound his ear could detect was the distant rumbling of the wheels of the vehicle that bore away the object of his search the notary who supposed it to be the carriage of some person whose business or pleasure took them late from home paid no attention to this circumstance there was then no chance of finding cecily whose absence was the more disastrous as she carried with her the positive proof of his crimes as this fearful certainty came over him he fell struck with consternation on a bench placed against his door where he long remained mute motionless and as though petrified with horror his eyes fixed and haggard his teeth clenched and his lips covered with foam tearing his breast as though unconsciously till the blood streamed from it he felt his very brain dizzy with thought till his ideas were lost in a fathomless abyss when he recovered from his stupor he arose and staggered onwards with an unsteady and faltering step like a person just aroused from a state of complete intoxication he violently shut the entrance door and returned to the courtyard the rain had by this time ceased but the wind still continued strong and gusty and drove rapidly along the heavy grey clouds which veiled without entirely excluding the brightness of the moon whose pale and sickly light shone on the house somewhat calmed by the clear freshness of the night air jacques ferrand as though hoping to find relief from his internal agitation by the rapidity of his movements plunged into the muddy paths of his garden walking with quick hurried steps and from time to time pressing his clenched hands against his forehead heedless of the direction he proceeded in he at length reached the termination of a walk adjoining to which was a dilapidated greenhouse suddenly he stumbled heavily against a mass of newly disturbed earth mechanically he stooped down to examine the nature of the impediment which presented itself the deep hole which had been dug and morsels of torn garments lying by told him with awful certainty that he stood by the grave dug by poor louise morel to receive the remains of her dead infant her infant which was also the child of the heartless hardened wretch who now stood trembling and conscience-stricken beside this fearful memento of his sensuality and brutal persecution of a poor and helpless girl in spite of his hardihood his long course of sin and seared conscience a deadly tremor shook his frame he felt an instinctive persuasion that the hour of deep retribution was at hand under other circumstances jacques ferrand would have trampled the humble grave beneath his feet without remorse or concern but now exhausted by the preceding scene he felt his usual boldness forsake him while fear and trembling came upon him a cold sweat bedewed his brow his tottering knees refused to support him and he fell motionless beside the open grave End of chapter four read by celine major chapter five of the mysteries of paris volume five by eugene sue this librivox recording is in the public domain la force we may perhaps be accused from the space accorded to the following scenes of injuring the unity of our story by some episodical pictures but it seems to us that at this moment particularly when important questions of punishment are engaging the attention of the legislature that the interior of a prison that frightful pandemonium that gloomy thermometer of civilization will be an opportune study in a word the various physiognomies of prisoners of all classes the relations of kin or affection which still bind them to the world from which their jail walls separate them appear to us worthy of interest and attention 
we hope therefore to be excused for having grouped about many prisoners known to the readers of this history other secondary characters intended to put in relief certain ideas of criticism and to complete the initiation of a prison life let us enter la force there is nothing sombre or repulsive in the aspect of this house of incarceration in the rue du roi de sicile in the marais in the centre of one of the first courts there are some clumps of trees thickened with shrubs at the roots of which there are already here and there the green precocious shoots of primroses and snowdrops a raised accent surmounted by a porch covered with trellis work in which knotty stalks of the vine entwine leads to one of the seven or eight walks assigned to the prisoners the vast buildings which surround these courts very much resemble those of barrack or manufactory kept with exceeding care there are lofty facades of white stone pierced with high and large windows which admit of the free circulation of pure air the stones and pavement of the enclosures are kept excessively clean on the ground floor the large apartments warmed during the winter are kept well ventilated during the summer and are used during the day as places of conversation work or for the meals of the prisoners the upper stories are used as immense dormitories ten or twelve feet high with dry and shining floors two rows of iron beds are there arranged and excellent bedding it is consisting of a palliasse a soft and thick mattress a bolster white linen sheets and a warm woollen blanket at the sight of these establishments comprising all the requisites for comfort and health we are much surprised in spite of ourselves being accustomed to suppose that prisons are miserable dirty unwholesome and dark this is a mistake it is such dog-holes as that occupied by morel the lapidary and in which so many poor and honest workmen languish in exhaustion compelled to give up their truckle bed to a sick wife and to leave with hopeless despair their wretched famishing children shuddering with cold in their infected straw that is miserable dark dirty and pestilent the same contrast holds with respect to the physiognomy of the inhabitants of these two abodes incessantly occupied with the wants of their family which they can scarcely supply from day to day seeing a destructive competition lessen their wages the laborious artisans become dejected dispirited the hour of rest does not sound for them and a kind of somnolent lassitude alone breaks in upon their overtasked labour then on awakening from this painful lethargy they find themselves face to face with the same overwhelming thoughts of the present and the same uneasiness for the future but the prisoner indifferent to the past happy with the life he leads certain of the future for he can be assured by an offence or a crime regretting his liberty doubtless but finding much compensation in the actual enjoyment certain of taking with him when he quits prison a considerable sum of money gained by easy and moderate labour esteemed or rather dreaded by his companions in proportion to his depravity and perversity the prisoner on the contrary will always be gay and careless again we ask what does he want does he not find in prison good shelter good bed good food high wages note one easy work and especially society at his choice a society we repeat which measures his consideration by the magnitude of his crimes a hardened convict knows neither misery hunger nor cold what is to him the horror he inspires honest persons withal he does not see does not know them his crimes made his glory his influence his strength with the ruffians in the midst of whom he will henceforward pass his life why should he fear shame instead of the serious and charitable remonstrances which might compel him to blush for and repent the past he hears the ferocious applauses which encourage him to theft and murder scarcely imprisoned he plans fresh crimes what can be more logical if discovered and at once apprehended he will find the repose the bodily supplies of a prison and his joyous and daring associates of crime and debauchery if his experience in crimes be less than that of others does he for that invince the less remorse it follows that he is exposed to brutal scoffing infernal taunts and horrible threats and a thing so rare that it has become the exception to the rule if the prisoner leaves this fearful pandemonium with the firm resolution to return to the pass of honesty by excessive labour courage patience and honesty and has been able to conceal the infamy of his past career 
the meeting with one of his old comrades in jail is sufficient to overturn this good intention for the restoration of his character so painfully struggled for note one high wages if we reflect that with all expenses paid the prisoner may gain from five to ten sous a day how many workmen are there who can save such a sum and in this way a hardened discharged convict proposes a job to a repentant comrade the latter in spite of bitter menaces refuses this criminal association forthwith an anonymous information reveals the life of the unfortunate fellow who was desirous at every sacrifice of concealing and expiating a first fault by honourable behaviour then exposed to the contempt or at least the distrust of those whose good will he had acquired by dint of industry and probity this man reduced to distress and urged by want yielding at length to incessant temptations although nearly restored to society will again fall and for ever into the depths of that abyss whence he had escaped with such difficulty in the following scenes we shall endeavour to demonstrate the monstrous and inevitable consequences of confinement in masses after ages of barbarous experiments and pernicious hesitations it seemed suddenly understood how irrational it is to plunge into an atmosphere of deepest vice persons whom a pure and salubrious air could alone save how many centuries to discover that in placing in dense contact diseased beings we redouble the intensity of their malignity which is thus rendered incurable how many centuries to discover that there is in a word but one remedy for this overwhelming leprosy which threatens society isolation we should esteem ourselves happy if our feeble voice could be if not relied upon at least spread amongst all those which more imposing more eloquent than our own demand with such just and impatient urgency the entire and unqualified application of the cell system one day perchance society will know that wickedness is an accidental not an organic malady that crimes are almost always the results of perverted instincts impulses still good in their essence but falsified rendered evil by ignorance egotism or the carelessness of governments and that the health of the soul like that of the body is unquestionably kept subordinate to the laws of a healthy and preserving system of control god bestows on all passions that strive for predominance strong appetites the desire to be at ease and it is for society to balance and satisfy these wants the man who only participates in strength goodwill and health has a right a sovereign right to have his labour justly remunerated in a way that shall assure to him not the superfluities but the necessaries of life the means of continuing healthy and strong active and industrious and consequently honest and good because his condition is rendered happy the gloomy regions of misery and ignorance are peopled with morbid beings with withered hearts purify these moral sewers spread instruction the inducement to labour fair wages just rewards and then these unhealthy faces these perishing frames will be restored to virtue which is the health the life of the soul let us now introduce the reader into the room in the prison of la force in which the prisoners are allowed to see persons who visit them it is a dark place partitioned in its length into two equal parts by a narrow grated division one of these divisions communicates with the interior of the prison and is the place for the prisoners the other communicates with the turnkey's lobby and is devoted to the persons admitted to visit the prisoners these interviews and conversations take place through the double iron grating of the reception room in presence of the turnkey who remains in the interior at the extremity of the passage the appearance of the prisoners who were in this room on the day in question offered great contrasts some were clad in wretched attire others seemed to belong to the working class and some to the wealthy citizen body the same contrasts were remarkable amongst the visitors to the prisoners who were nearly all women the prisoners generally appear less downcast than the visitors for strange and sad to say yet proved by experience there is but little sorrow or shame left after the experience of three or four days spent in prison in society those who most dreaded this hideous community habituate themselves to it quickly the contagion gains upon them surrounded by degraded beings hearing only the language of infamy a kind of ferocious rivalry excites them and either to emulate their companions in the struggle for brutalism or to make themselves giddy by the usual drunkenness 
the newcomers almost invariably display as much depravity and recklessness as the habitués of the prison let us return to the reception room notwithstanding the noisy hum of a great many conversations carried on in the undertones on each side of the divisions prisoners and visitors after some experience are able to converse with each other without being for a moment disturbed by or attentive to the conversation of their neighbours which creates a kind of secrecy in the midst of this noisy interchange of words each being compelled to hear the individual who addressed him but not to hear a word of what was said around him amongst the prisoners called into the reception-room by visitors the one the farthest off from the turnkey was nicolas martial to the extreme depression with which he was seized on his apprehension had succeeded the most brazen assurance already the detestable and contagious influence of a prison in common bore its fruits no doubt had he been at once conveyed to a solitary cell this wretch still under the influence of his first terror and alone with the thought of his crimes fearful of impending punishment might have experienced if not repentance at least that wholesome dread from which nothing would have distracted him and who knows what incessant compulsory meditation may produce on a guilty mind reflecting on the crimes committed and the punishment that is to follow far from this thrown into the midst of a horde of bandits in whose eyes the least sign of repentance is cowardice or rather treason which they make him dearly expiate for in their savage obduracy their senseless bravado they consider every man as a spy on them who sad and disconsolate regretting his fault does not join in their audacious recklessness and trembles at their contact thrown into the midst of these miscreants nicolas martial who had for a long time by report known the prison manners overcame his weakness and wished to appear worthy of a name already celebrated in the annals of robbery and murder several old offenders had known his father who had been executed and others his brother who was at the galleys he was received and instantly patronized by these veterans in crime with savage interest this fraternal reception between murderer and murderer elevated the widow's son the praises bestowed on the hereditary infamy of his family intoxicated him soon forgetting in this horrible mood the future that threatened him he only remembered his past crimes to glory in them and elevate himself still higher in the eyes of his companions the expression of nicolas's physiognomy was then as insolent as that of his visitor was disturbed and alarmed this visitor was daddy micou the receiver and lodging housekeeper in the passage de la brasserie into whose abode madame de fermont and her daughter victims of jacques ferrand's cupidity had been compelled to retreat father micou knew the penalties to which he was amenable for having many a time and oft obtained at low prices the fruits of the robberies of nicolas and many others of his stamp the widow's son being apprehended the receiver felt he was almost at the mercy of the ruffian who might impeach him as a regular buyer although this accusation could not be supported by flagrant proofs still it was not the less dangerous the less dreaded by daddy micou and he had thus instantly obeyed the orders which nicolas had transmitted to him by a discharged prisoner ah, ah how goes it daddy micou said the brigand at your service my good fellow replied the receiver eagerly as soon as i saw the person you sent to me i directly oh you are becoming ceremonious daddy said nicolas with impatience why is this because i'm in trouble no no my lad no no replied the receiver who was not anxious to seem on terms of familiarity with this ruffian come come be as familiar as usual or i shall think you have forgotten our intimacy and that would break my heart well well said micou with a groan i directly went about your little commissions that's all right daddy i knew well enough that you would not forget your friends and my tobacco i have left two pounds at the lodge my boy is it good cannot be better and the knuckle of ham left at the lodge also with a four-pound white loaf and i have added something that will surprise you in the shape of a dozen hard eggs and a dutch cheese this is what i call doing the thing like a friend and the wine six bottles of capital but you know you will only have one bottle a day well that can't be helped and so one must make up one's mind to it i hope you are satisfied with me my boy certain and i shall be so again and for ever father micou 
for the ham the cheese the eggs and the wine will only last just so long as it takes to swallow them but as a friend of mine remarked when they are gone there'll be more where they came from thanks to you who will always do the handsome thing so long as i do the same what you expect that in two or three days you will renew my little stock daddy dear devil burn me if i do it's all very good for once for once what do you mean man why ham and wine are always good you know that very well certainly but i have not undertaken to feed you in delicacies oh daddy miku that's shabby indecent what refuse me ham one who has so often brought you double tress stolen lead hush hush you mischievous fellow cried the alarmed receiver no i'll put the question to the big wig the judge i'll say to him only imagine now sir the daddy miku hush hush exclaimed the receiver seeing with equal alarm and anger that nicolas was much disposed to abuse the influence which their guilty companionship gave him i'll agree i will renew your provision when it is consumed that's all right and what's fair and you mustn't forget too to send some coffee to mother and calabash who are at st lazare they like a cup in a morning and they'll miss it what more would you ruin me you extortionate fellow oh just as you like daddy miku don't say another word but i shall ask the big wig well then they shall have the coffee said the receiver interrupting him but devil take you a cursed be the day when i first knew you old boy i say quite the contrary i am delighted to have your valuable acquaintance at this particular moment i revere you as a nursing father i hope you have nothing more to ask of me said miku with bitterness yes say to my mother and sister that if i was frightened when they apprehended me i am no longer so but as determined as they two are i'll say so anything more stay another moment or two i forgot to ask you for a couple of pairs of warm woollen stockings you'd be sorry if i caught cold shouldn't you i should be glad if you were dead thank ye daddy thank ye but that pleasure is yet to come and to-day i'm alive and kicking and inclined to take things easy if they serve me as they did my father at least i shall have enjoyed my life while it lasted it's a nice life yours is superb since i have been here i have enjoyed myself like a king if we had lamps and fireworks they would have lighted them up and fired them off in my honour when they knew i was the son of the famous martial who was guillotined how affecting what a glorious parentage why do you see there are many dukes and marquises why then shouldn't we have our nobility too such as us said the ruffian with bitter irony to be sure and charlot the headsman will give you your letters of nobility on the place du palais you may be sure it won't be the jail chaplain but in prison we should have the nobility of top sawyers noted robbers to be thought much of if not you are looked upon as nobody at all you should only see how they behave to those who are not tip-tops and give themselves airs now there's in here a chap called germain a young fellow who appears disgusted with us and seems to despise us all let him take care of his hide he's a sulky hound and they say he is a nose a spy if he is they'll screw his nose around just by way of warning germain a young man called germain yes do you know him is he one of us if so in spite of his looks we i don't know him but if he is the germain i have heard speak of his affair is settled how why he has only just escaped from a plot which velu and the stout cripple laid for him lately why i don't know but they said that in the country somewhere he had tricked one of their pals i was sure of it germain is a spy well we'll spy him i'll go and tell our friends that'll set them sharper against him by the way how does gold Boiteux get on with your lodgers thank heaven i got rid of him a blackguard you'll see him here to-day or to-morrow all right how we shall laugh he's a boy who is never taken aback 
it's because i knew that he would find this germain here that i saw his affair was settled if it's the same chap why have they got hold of the gros boiteux for a robbery committed with a discharged convict who wanted to turn honest and work well you see the gros boiteux soon got him in a string he is such a vicious devil the boiteux i am certain it was he who broke open the trunk of the two women who live in the little room on my fourth floor what women ah yes two women you were smitten by the young un i remember you old vagabond because you thought her so nice they'll not smite anybody any more for by this time the mother must be dead and the daughter is scarcely alive i shall lose a fortnight's rent and i shan't give you a sou to pay for their burial i've had so many losses without talking of the little matters you entreat me to give you and your family that my affairs are quite disarranged i've had the luck of it this year pooh pooh you are always complaining old gentleman you who are as rich as croesus but don't let me detain you you're polite you'll call and tell me how mother and calabash are when you bring me my other provisions yes if i must ah i'd nearly forgot whilst you're about it bring me a new cap of plaid velvet with an acorn at top mine's regularly done for come now you're laughing at me no daddy by no means i want a plaid velvet cap that's my wish then you're resolved to make a beggar of me come i say miku don't get out of temper about it it's only yes or no i do not force you but you understand the receiver reflecting that he was at the mercy of nicolas rose fearing that if he prolonged his visit he would be exposed to fresh demands you shall have your cap he replied but mind if you ask me for anything more i will give you nothing let what will occur you'll suffer as much as i shall make your mind easy i'll not make you sing force you to give money under the threat of certain disclosures more than is sufficient for you not to lose your voice for that would be a pity you sing so well the receiver went away shrugging his shoulders with rage and the turnkey conducted nicolas back to the interior of the prison at the moment when micou quitted the reception-room rigolette entered it the turnkey a man about forty years of age an old soldier with stern and marked features was dressed in a round jacket with a blue cap and trousers two silver stars were embroidered on the collar and facings of his jacket at the sight of the grisette the face of this man brightened up and assumed an expression of benevolence he had always been struck by the grace gentleness and touching kindness with which rigolette consoled germain when she came there to see him germain was besides not an ordinary prisoner his reserve his peaceable demeanour and his melancholy inspired the persons about the prison with deep interest an interest which they did not manifest for fear of exposing him to the ill-treatment of his brutal companions who as we have said looked upon him with mistrusting hate it was raining in torrents but thanks to her galoshes and umbrella rigolette had boldly faced the wind and rain what a shocking day my poor girl said the turnkey kindly it requires a good deal of courage to leave home such weather as this when we think as we come along of the pleasure we shall give a poor prisoner we don't think much about the weather sir i need not ask you whom you have come to see certainly not and how is poor germain why my dear i have seen many prisoners they have been sad for a day two days perhaps and then gradually got into the same way as the others and those who were most out of sorts at first often ended by becoming the merriest of all but m germain is not one of these he has still that melancholy air how sorry i am to hear it when i'm on duty in the yards i look at him from the corner of my eye he is always alone i have already told you that you should advise him not to do so but to resolve on conversing with the others or it will end with his becoming suspected and ill-used by them we keep a close lookout, but a mischievous blow is soon given oh sir is there any danger threatens him cried rigolette not precisely but these ruffians see that he is not one of them and hate him because he has an honest and proud look yet i advised him to do what you told me sir 
and make up his mind to talk to some of the least wicked but he cannot help it he cannot get over his repugnance he is wrong wrong the struggle is so soon begun can't he then be separated from the others for the last two or three days since i have seen their ill-will towards him i advised him to place himself what we call a la pistole that is in a room well i had not thought of one thing a whole row of cells is undergoing repair and the others are full but these wretches may kill him said rigolette her eyes filling with tears and if by chance he had any protectors what could they do for him sir nothing but enable him to obtain what these debtors who can pay for it obtain a chamber a la pistole alas then he is lost if they hate him in prison oh don't be downhearted we will look well to him but i repeat my dear to advise him to familiarize himself a little the first step is half the battle i will advise him as strongly as i can sir but for a good and honest heart it is very hard you know to familiarize itself with such people of two evils we must choose the least now i will fetch m germain but now i think of it said the turnkey there are only two visitors wait until they are gone there'll not be any more to-day for it is two o'clock i will then fetch m germain and you can talk at your ease i can then when you are alone let him come into the passage so that you will be separated by one grating instead of two won't that be better oh sir how kind you are and how much i thank you hush do not let any one hear you or they may be jealous sit down there at the end of the bench and when this man and women have gone i will tell m germain the turnkey returned to his post inside the grating and rigolette sat down very melancholy at the end of the visitor's bench whilst the grisette is awaiting the coming of germain we will allow the reader to overhear the conversation of the prisoners who remained there after the departure of nicolas martial end of chapter five read by celine major chapter six of the mysteries of paris volume five by eugene sue this librivox recording is in the public domain pic vinaigre part one the prisoner who was beside barbillon was a man about forty-five years of age thin mean-looking with a keen intelligent jovial merry face he had an enormous mouth almost entirely toothless and when he spoke he worked it from side to side very much after the style of those orators who are accustomed to harangue from booths at fairs his nose was flat his head disproportionately large and nearly bald he wore an old grey knit worsted waistcoat a pair of trousers of indescribable colour torn and patched in a thousand places his feet half wrapped up in pieces of old linen were thrust into wooden shoes this man fortuné gobert called pic vinaigre formerly a juggler a convict freed after condemnation for the crime of uttering false money was charged with having broken from jail and committed violent burglary having been confined but very few days in la force pic vinaigre already filled the office of story-teller to the general satisfaction of his fellow-prisoners now story-tellers have become very rare but formerly each ward had usually for a slight general subscription its official story-teller who by his narrations made the long winter evenings appear less tedious when the prisoners went to bed at sunset if it be curious to note the desire for these fictions which these outcasts display it is yet a more singular thing to reflect upon the hearing of these recitals men corrupted to the very marrow thieves and murderers prefer especially the histories in which are expressed generous heroic sentiments recitals in which weakness and goodness are avenged in fierce retribution it is the same thing with women of lost reputation they are singularly fond of simple touching and sentimental details and almost invariably refuse to read obscene books pic vinaigre excelled in that kind of heroic tales in which weakness after a thousand trials concludes by triumphing over persecution he possessed besides a deep fund of satire which had procured for him his name his repartees being very frequently ironical or merry he had just entered the reception-room opposite to him on the other side of the grating was a female of about thirty-five years of age of pale mild and interesting countenance 
meanly but cleanly clad she was weeping bitterly and held a handkerchief to her eyes pique vinaigre looked at her with a mixture of impatience and affection come jeanne he said do not play the child it is sixteen years since we met and to keep your handkerchief up to your eyes is not the way for us to know each other again brother my poor dear fortune i am choking i cannot speak ah nonsense what ails you his sister repressed her sobs wiped her eyes and looking at him with astonishment replied what ails me what when i find you again in prison where you have already been fifteen years true it is six months to-day since i left melun and i didn't call upon you in paris because the capital was forbidden to me why did you leave beaugency when you were under surveillance in the first place jeanne since the gratings are between us you must fancy i have embraced you squeezed you in my arms as a man ought to do who has not seen his sister for an eternity now let us talk a prisoner at melun who is called the gros boiteux told me that there was at beaugency an old convict of his acquaintance who employed the freed prisoners in a factory of white lead those who work at it in a month or two catch the lead colic one in three of those attacked die it is true that others die also but they take their time about it and get on sometimes as long as a year or even eighteen months then the trade is better paid than most others and there are fellows who hold out at it for two or three years but they are elders patriarchs of the white leaders they die it is true but that is all and why did you choose a trade so dangerous that they die at it what could i do when i went to melun for that well-known job of the forged coin i was a thimble-rigger as in jail there was no scope for my line of business and i am not stronger than a good stout flea they put me to making children's toys there was a tradesman in paris who found it very advantageous to have his wooden trumpets and swords made by the prisoners why i must have made half the wooden swords used by the children of paris and i was great in the trumpet line rattles too why with two of my manufacture i could have set on edge the teeth of a whole battalion well when my time was up i was a first-rate maker of penny trumpets and my only resource was making the child's playthings now supposing that a whole town young and old were inclined to play tur tu 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 on my trumpets i should still have had a good deal of trouble to earn a livelihood and then i could not have induced a whole population to continue playing the trumpet from morning to night you are still such a jester better joke than cry well then seeing that at forty leagues from paris my trade of juggler was no more useful to me than my trumpets i requested the surveillance at beaugency intending to become a white leader it is a trade that gives you indigestion enough to send you mad but until one bursts one lives and that is always something and it was better than turning thief i am neither brave nor strong enough to thieve and it was from pure accident that i did the thing i have just mentioned to you and yet you had the courage to take up with the deadly trade come now fortune you wish to make yourself out worse than you are i thought that the malady would have so little to take hold of in me that it would go elsewhere and that i should become one of the patriarchal white leaders well when i came out of prison i found my earnings had considerably increased by telling stories so you told us you remember how it amused poor old mother dear soul she never suspected that i was at melun never she thought you had gone abroad why my girl my follies were my father's fault who dressed me up as a clown to help in his mountbank displays to swallow tow and spit fire which did not allow me spare time to form acquaintance with the sons of the peers of france and so i fell into bad company but to return to beaugency when once i had left melun like the rest i thought i must see some fun if not what was the use of my money well i reached beaugency with scarcely a sou in my pocket i asked for velu the friend of gros Boiteux, the head of the manufactory your servant there was no longer any white lead factory it had killed eleven persons in the year and the old convict had shut up shop so here i was in the middle of this city with my talent for trumpet-making as my only means of existence and my discharge from prison as my only certificate of recommendation i did my best to procure work but in vain 
one called me a thief another a beggar a third said i had escaped from jail all turned their backs upon me so i had nothing to do but die of hunger in a city which i was not to leave for five years seeing this i broke my ban and came to paris to utilize my talents as i had not the means to travel in a coach and four i came begging and tramping all the way avoiding the gendarme as i would a mad dog i had luck and reached auteuil without accident i was very tired hungry as a wolf and dressed as you may see not in the height of the fashion and pique vinaigre glanced comically at his rags i had not a sou and was liable to be taken up as a vagabond well ma foi an occasion presented itself the devil tempted me and in spite of my cowardice enough brother enough said his sister fearing lest the turnkey might hear his dangerous confession are you afraid they listen he said be tranquil i have nothing to conceal i was taken in the act alas said jeanne weeping bitterly how calmly you say this if i spoke warmly what should i gain by it come listen to reason jeanne must i have to console you jeanne wiped her eyes and sighed well to go back to my affair continued pique vinaigre i had nearly reached auteuil in the dusk i could not go any farther and i did not wish to enter paris but at night so i sat down behind a hedge to rest myself and reflect on my plan of campaign my reflections sent me to sleep and when the sound of voices awoke me it was night i listened it was a man and woman who were talking as they went along on the other side of the hedge the man said to the woman who do you think would come and rob us haven't we left the house alone a hundred times yes replied the woman but then we hadn't a hundred francs in the drawers who knows that you fool says the husband you are right replies the wife and on they went ma foi the occasion seemed to me too favourable to lose and there was no danger i waited until they got a little farther on and then came from behind the hedge and looking twenty paces behind me i saw a small cottage which i was sure must be the house with the hundred francs as it was the only habitation in sight auteuil was about five hundred yards off i said to myself courage old boy there is no one then it is night if there is no watchdog you know i was always afraid of dogs why the job is as good as done luckily there was no dog to make sure i knocked at the door nothing this encouraged me the shutters were closed on the ground floor but i put my stick between and forced them i got into the window and in the room the fire was still alight so i saw the drawers but no key with the tongs i forced the lock and under a heap of linen i found the prize wrapped in an old woollen stocking i did not think of anything else but jumping out of the window i alighted on the back of the garde champetre who was returning home what a misfortune the moon had risen he saw me jump from the window and seized me he was a fellow who could have eaten a dozen such as i was too great a coward to resist i surrendered quietly i had the stocking still in my hand and he heard the money chink took it put it in his game bag and made me accompany him to auteuil we reached the mayor's with a crowd of black guards and gendarmes the owners of the cottage were fetched and they made their depositions there was no means of denial so i confessed everything and signed the depositions and they put on me handcuffs and i was brought here in prison again and for a long time perhaps listen to me jeanne for i will not deceive you i may as well tell you at once for it is no longer an affair of prison why not why the relapse the breaking in and entry into a dwelling-house at night the lawyer told me is a complete affair and i shall have fifteen or twenty years at the galleys and the public exposure into the bargain the galleys and you so weak why you'll die and suppose i had been with the white lead party but the galleys the galleys it is a prison in the open air with a red shirt instead of a brown one and then i have always had a curiosity to see the sea 
but the public exposure to be subject to the contempt of all the world oh my poor brother and the poor woman wept bitterly come come jeanne be composed it is an uncomfortable quarter of an hour to pass but you know i am used to see crowds when i played with my cup and balls i always had a crowd around me so i'll fancy i am thimble-rigging and if it has too much effect on me i'll close my eyes and that will seem as if no one was looking at me speaking with this derision the unhappy man affected this insensibility in order to console his sister for a man accustomed to the manners of prisons and in whom all shame is utterly dead the bagne galleys is in fact only a change of shirt as picbinego said with frightful truth many prisoners in the central prisons even prefer the bagne because of the riotous life they lead often committing attempts at murder in order to be sent to brest or toulon twenty years at the galleys repeated pic vinaigre's poor sister take comfort jeanne they will only pay me as i deserve i am too weak to be put to hard labour and if there is no manufactory of wooden trumpets and swords as at malin why i shall be set to some easy work they will employ me at the infirmary i am not a troublesome fellow but a good easy chap and i shall tell my stories as i do here and shall be esteemed by my chiefs and adored by my comrades and i will send you carved coconuts and straw boxes for my nephews and nieces if you had only written to me that you were coming to paris i would have tried to conceal you until you found work pardieu i meant to have gone to you but i preferred arriving with my hands full for i see you do not ride in your carriage well and your children and your husband has left me these three years after having sold off every stick not leaving me or the children one single thing but a straw paillasse poor jeanne how have you managed alone with three children why i have suffered very much i worked at my business as a trimming maker as well as i could the neighbours helping me a little watching my children when i went out and then i who haven't much luck had a bit of good fortune once in my life but it was no avail because of my husband how was that my employer had spoken of my trouble to one of his customers telling him how my husband had left me with nothing after having sold all our furniture and that in spite of this i was working as hard as i could to bring up my children one day when i returned what did i find why my room fitted up again a good bed furniture and linen it was the kind customer of my employer poor sister why didn't you write and tell me of your misfortune and then instead of spending my money i would have sent you some what i free to ask of you a prisoner why not i was fed clothed lodged at the cost of government all i gained was so much profit but knowing my brother-in-law was a good workman and you a good manager and worker i was quite easy and melted my tin with my eyes shut and my mouth open my husband was a good workman that is true but he became dissipated however thanks to this unexpected aid i took courage again my eldest girl began to earn a little and we were happy except when we remembered that you were at melun work went well with us and my children were well clad and wanted for nothing hardly and that gave me good heart and i had actually saved thirty-three francs when suddenly my husband returned i had not seen him for a year and when he found me so well off and tidily dressed he stood for nothing but took my money and lived with us without working getting drunk every day and beating me when i complained and that is not all he gave up a small room adjoining ours to a woman with whom he lived openly as his mistress so i had that indignity to endure for the second time he soon began to make away with the few poor things i had managed to get together so foreseeing what would be the end of such conduct i went to a lawyer who lived in the same house and begged him to advise me how to act to prevent my husband from taking the very bed from me and my children why there needed no lawyer i should think to tell you that the only thing you had to do was to turn your husband out of your doors ah uh, but i could not the law gave me no power to do so the lawyer told me that as head of the family my husband could take up his abode wherever i dwelt 
and was not compelled to labour unless he liked that it was very hard for me to have to maintain him and endure his ill-treatment into the bargain but that he recommended me to submit to it though certainly the circumstance of his having a mistress living under the same roof entitled me to demand separation from bed and board as he called it and further that as i would bring witnesses to prove his having repeatedly struck me and otherwise ill-treated me i could institute a suit against him but that it would cost me at the very least from four to five hundred francs to obtain a perfect separation from him only think what a sum as much as i should earn in a year and who would lend me so much money which would have to be repaid heaven knows how for four or five hundred francs is a perfect fortune yet there is one very simple means of amassing the money replied pique vinaigre bitterly that of living upon air during the twelve months it would take you to earn that sum working all the same but denying yourself even the necessaries of life and i am only surprised the lawyer did not advise you to starve yourself and your children or any other kind-hearted expediency you always make a jest of everything brother this time however i am not in a jesting humour it is scandalous that the law should be so expensive to poor creatures such as we now just look at yourself a good and affectionate mother striving by every means in your power to bring up your children honestly and creditably your husband a bad lazy fellow who not content with stripping you of all you earn that he may spend his time in drinking and all sorts of loose pleasures beats and ill-uses you into the bargain well you apply to the justice of your country for protection for yourself and your children ah says the lawyers yours is a hard case and your husband is a worthless vagabond and you shall have justice but then you must pay five hundred francs for that same justice five hundred francs mind precisely all your utmost labour can obtain to nourish yourself and family for a year i tell you what jeanne all this proves the truth of the old saying that there are but two sorts of people those who are hanged and those who deserve to be End of chapter six part one read by celine major